Welcome back to the Ecclesia Project. I am a freedman of God as your host on this journey to discover the lost Ecclesia of God. Um, this is episode 67, and we are still in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, and we went through uh, verses 17 through 19 uh, last time, but we're going to continue on with those verses um, and and talk a little bit more about this, this issue regarding uh, jealousy and um, strife, uh, mainly uh, competition in the ecclesia, where uh, men, the members of the ecclesia, will bring into the ecclesia uh, their, the rules of Satan's kingdom, and they will adopt and govern themselves and, and have a perspective of um, Satan's or, or uh, the worldly definition of, of greatness, uh, the worldly definition of authority, um, and, and we'll try to bring that into an ecclesia of God, which is supposed to be an image of the kingdom of God, um, that has completely different definitions of greatness and authority and, and how that plays out. So, um, but it's quite common uh, because the members have grown up in the world. Uh, this is the rules that they've, uh, that they've followed all their lives uh, with respect to the world. Um, and so it's embedded in them as to uh, what constitutes greatness. What, what does greatness look like? What does authority look like? Uh, what does it mean uh, to be, uh, you know, rated higher than another? What does what does that look like? Um, so it's it's uh, you, you know, somewhat. You might think, oh, well, th that just any any of that talk uh, should be banned in a, in an ecclesia of God. Uh, no one should discuss those those types of ideas you know, about ratings or, or greatness or, um, you know, uh, receiving rewards or, or anything, any of that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> that's, that's really not how scripture handles it. I mean, if, uh, if you look at, at the scripture and, and we're going to take a look uh, right now at, um, at, at a scripture where, um, Jesus handled this this issue, and and it's it's interesting how he handled it. Um. So so if 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 you looked at Matthew twenty, and uh and and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this passage, but um. You know it it was it was towards the end you know of of his uh, it was right before the triumphal entry and in, into Jerusalem right um, which is kind of you know the Palm Sunday, uh, which might be appropriate for the season, but um, so it was right before that that this little uh, dialogue occurred uh, between the the mother of the sons of Zebedee, which is James and John. Right, uh, James and John were always kind of um, given some preference by Jesus, uh, James, John, and Peter. Uh, as far as being included in in certain activities that that Jesus would do, um, and you know they, they seemed to be separated from the group it, it, in a sense where they were kind of in the inner inner circle. You know, it's like the inner inner circle, um, and that's that's the way Jesus did it. I I don't know if there was any hard feelings regarding that. Uh, with respect to the other disciples, um, it doesn't seem to be clear about that. But um, here's this is this is one uh, account where the the mother of the sons of, of Zebedee they it came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. All right, so this is all staged, planned, 
you know, this is what we're going to do, James and John. And the mother it seems like, you know, ambitious, right? Uh, wanting to uh, put her sons in, in a in a in a in a um, in, in a superior position, uh, in a better position than, than the others, which you might think, wow, that's you know, that that could uh, backfire quite a bit, you know, c considering the fact that, you know, the mother is with other women that are uh, that that would travel and and follow uh christ and and service him and 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 do things uh for the disciples as they as they travel along uh a lot of times the women would would uh kind of you know provide all kinds of you know d different support uh to to the to the to the disciples um but it says, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee come to Jesus, came to Jesus with her sons bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, command that in your kingdom, again, it very much the kingdom of God was, was foremost on the minds of those that followed him. Um, it, it was really about the kingdom of God. It, I mean, his message was always about the kingdom, kingdom of God's at hand. You know, a lot about the kingdom of God, kingdom of God. So, um, and that, that's that been kind of lost, uh, you know, today it's, 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 it's mainly about uh, provision of sin and he died for your sin, he loves you and, and that kind of stuff. It, it doesn't really focus on kingdom of God um, it, as we talk about Christianity today and, and, uh, and, and and who Jesus is and what he's done and, and all it, and, and that's again it's part of the the church system uh message and and messaging um that 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 they push the provision of sin and they eliminate everything else and 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 so it's it's really kind of a a very uh, truncated message uh it's not it's certainly not the full gospel of the kingdom of God but um, so she says, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit on, uh, sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. And, and then I, I imagine he was looking at the sons as, as, um, as he was talking about this, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink? that I'm about to drink. Uh, and they said to him, we are able. Of course, they had no idea what the cup was. I mean, I, I can't imagine they, they would have any clue about what was what was coming. But, you know, the mother's there. Uh, they're not going to sit there and go, well, you know, I don't know. What's the cup? They're not going to, they're not going to do that. They're, they're going to basically, yeah, well, whatever, whatever it takes, Jesus, we got this, um, you know, and, and we're, we're ready we're not going to disappoint our mom and we're going to, we'll do whatever it takes. We are able. And he said to them, my cup, you shall drink. Uh, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been uh, prepared from by my father. And you have to think what, you know, we know that, uh, we know that for instance, um, James and John, we know James was killed by a sword and it was early on. Uh, wasn't crucified. Didn't, wasn't, you know, given 90 lashes or 99 lashes or uh, wasn't tortured. Uh, it was just basically run through uh, with a sword. And, and that's, and that, that was the end. Uh, and, and that was early on. I mean, before, Paul got it even started. It was just uh, something that happened very quickly. And so his uh, his sacrifice or his, you know, uh, you know, his life uh, with respect to after the death of, of Christ was was pretty limited. And um, who knows what what he actually was able to do before he died. But it couldn't have been, you know, there wasn't a, a big resume, I imagine, after after uh, after the death of Christ. So, 
and, and John never, he, he never uh, was martyred at all. So you always wonder what what does he mean by uh, my cup you shall drink, and, and and what does it mean where he says are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink, and they said we are able, and he said my cup you shall drink, you know, well it certainly wasn't the cup of crucifixion or or torture or anything like that that happened because that that didn't happen with James and John, um, so it's. It sounds like uh, it, it was more about, um, you know, it seems like it, it, it's the cup of, uh, of of just laying down your life for the, for the people of God, just dedicating your life and, and giving your life, which both of them did do. And, um, and it, I, I don't, I don't really know what it could mean uh, aside from that, uh, you know, um, it, you know, there, there. I guess you could uh, talk about the idea of the cup that was passed around in the Lord's Supper, and and you know, you know, this is this is a new covenant, in my blood, and you know, and you could talk about that as as maybe, uh, well, but but everyone goes back to the idea of, uh, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, obviously, and you're thinking in those terms about, you know, the cup. You know, if if this cup could, you know, um, I forget the, you know the exact words, but it, you know, if if we could, if, if I could somehow not drink this cup, and and you know, and 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 still achieve everything, you know, that would be great. You know, talking to his father, um, but um, that that wasn't you know that wasn't to be obviously, but. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to actually find it right now. Uh, where, where, the language? Let me. Let me see if I can. Oh, let this cup pass from me. Uh, yet not as I will, but as you will. So, the cup that he was going to drink was obviously we know what that cup is going to look like, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's going to be a lot of torture it's going to be crucifixion it's going to be spitting it's going to be humiliation it's going to be a lot of of pain and agony um but that was his cup and if you think about what okay so what is the cup itself the cup itself is is laying down your life for the for the people of god you know it, it just happens that the cup that he is going to drink, uh, that is tailored for him, is is going to be a very brutal experience, a very brutal experience. Okay, the cup that um, that James had to drink well, wasn't fun. Nobody wants to get run through with a sword, um, but not not nearly as brutal as as the cup that Jesus drank. But if you think about the cup being laying down your life for the people of God, that is similar. They, they, they both have that in common, okay? James did it, and Jesus did it. It just happens that when Jesus' cup tailored for him and how he was going to lay down his life was going to be a very brutal experience, you know, full of agony. James, not so much, but still a martyr. Um, John, not a martyr but at the same time did lay lay down his life for the for the people of god gave it gave up you know and he was isolated on on patmos and and so there was you know certain things repercussions for his determination and commitment to lay down his life for the people of god so they have all that in common okay so that that's why it seems like the cup were, that that jesus is talking about um, where Jesus is going to drink it, James is going to drink it, John is going to drink it. The the only thing I can I can you know kind of make sense out of it is that the cup itself is the idea that you're laying down your life for the people of God. And even when you drink of the cup that Jesus would pass around in the Lord's Supper, uh, you know the new covenant, my blood, uh, do this in remembrance of me. Um, 
it, it, it's, it, it does have that type of commitment also, where when you drink of the cup and, and you're drinking of that new covenant, knowing that, that, that you are now obligated to walk uh, in the commands of Christ and walk in the Spirit. Uh, and one of the commands of Christ is to pick up your cross and follow Him. So it's, it's again, drinking from that cup means when you're doing the Lord's Supper, that you're laying down your life for the people of God, okay? It, it's, it's all part of it. You're sharing in that cup, in that commitment, in that, in that um, you know, complete surrender where you're surrendering your life for the people of God. So that, the cup, it, it sounds to me, uh, when you when you uh, you know when you try to bring it all together, the one thing that all the cup has in common in all aspects is the fact of laying down your life for the people of God. Okay, um, but the cup is going to manifest itself, you know, differently in each life and how their their life will be laid down for the people of God. So it's going to be different, but it'll always have that common theme that whatever you do, what you're living for, what you're, you know, what, what you spend your time in doing, what you think about your, your passion, it's always about laying down your life for the people of God. Okay. Um, and in an ecclesia, we know that that's absolutely what you need to do. Love one another as I have loved you. And, and what did Jesus do? There's no other greater love than laying down your life for your friend. You see, it's always about laying down your life for the people of God. Um, and, and, and that's, uh, that's the common thing in, in all, in all the, uh, in, in all, on all of the, um, uh, the scenarios with, with Jesus, James, John, the, 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 the Lord's Supper, um, the commands of Christ, all of it has that same theme that seems to run through it. So it makes sense, uh, that that's really what Jesus means by the cup. My cup, you shall drink. You know, you will make that commitment. You will surrender your life uh, for the benefit of the people of God. Uh, I know you're going to do that and you're going to persevere to the end because that's what it means. When you're laying down your life, you're persevering to the end. I mean, it, 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 it means that you are definitely going to make it uh, to the end and and achieve uh, that inheritance and achieve entry into the kingdom of God. So, uh, but then he says, okay, you're going to do that, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give. Okay. So, um, you know, when, when, and then, and there's other passages about how, uh, how God, uh, you know, the father, would is designing this temple they call the temple of god the grand ecclesia is a temple of god and how he fits together the pieces and and fits together you know and uh and i i can't remember the exact word but it's a fitting together of of the stones you know of the living stones if you took took take language out of out of out of peter um you take you fit together the living stones to make this temple of God. And, and, and that language is, is in Ephesians or, or Colossians is one of those where they talk about that. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a beautiful uh, kind of um, illustration of how the Grand Ecclesia is going to work. It's always about this design. It's not just haphazard. It's just on a pile of bricks, right? Uh, where you just, you just pile on a bunch of saints and, and you just go for it. This is not this is so much more intricate and and um, and complex and and synergistic and it, it, there, it's a complementary. It's the, the the grand ecclesia is 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 about putting the right people in the right places, the right people together in the right you know uh, you know design and 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 setting up and and this is what God does. This is what God does. Just like God um, always designs his own temple, the, 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 the place where the spirit dwells. 
And and this will definitely be a, a place where the Spirit dwells, the Grand Ecclesia, and we'll design it inside and out. And He's the one that fits the pieces together. And so and so when Jesus says, "I you know I'm not building, you know I don't I'm not I don't I'm not in charge of of fitting these these living stones together. Uh, my Father's in charge of that. He's the one that does it, and He does it through me." But at the same time, he's the designer. He's the great designer. Okay, and um, and so you know, uh, the, these these positions aren't mine to give. I, I I would assume he would he would say none of the positions are really mine mine to give. Um, the Father designs it, and I may you know implement the design. I may affect, affect the design, make it make it happen. But the Father is actually the designer. And and through me the design gets accomplished. So, um, so he says to sit on my right and on my left. This is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Okay, um, and and hearing this, the ten uh, become indignant with the two brothers. Okay, so uh, James and John they're not the only ones that are bringing in this idea about what it, what does greatness look like now remember this isn't the first time this these kinds of questions who's the greatest in the kingdom of god this isn't the first time that this this type of this issue was approached and was 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 discussed and jesus in in prior uh, times has always said you know if you want to be the greatest you you'll be the best the greatest servant and, you know, and that that's how he's addressed. But somehow that just doesn't, you know what I mean? It, it, it just doesn't click a lot of times. It, it doesn't uh, seem to register that, um, you know, you could say it over and over and over again. And, and, and it takes probably a very long time to really accept that statement and to embrace that statement and to... Uh, uh, basically integrate that truth in your heart, in your mind, so that you're no longer um, interested in competition because you know it's worthless. In the world, uh, it, 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 it's, you know, it makes a, a lot of difference. It makes a huge difference on whether you're competitive or you're not, okay? If you sit complacent in the world, you're going to finish last most of the time, right? If you just be lethargic or, or I shouldn't say the word lethargic, but if you're not at all, um, you know, trying to put your best foot forward or competing with others or, or, or even thinking about those terms in those terms, then most likely in the world, you're not going to get recognized. You're not going to uh, be the greatest. You're, you're not going to be rated very high. Uh, you will be forgotten, right? The ones that that you know get to the top are the ones that compete very hard to get there in the world. Okay, but it's hard to understand it. But in the kingdom of God, it's not that way. It's completely the opposite. It's you know they, that's why they sometimes call it the upside down kingdom uh, because it it is upside down. Um, you know the first shall be last. The last shall be first. It, it's that idea where you want to be the greatest, you be the greatest servant, and and that uh, way of thinking, uh, after you've thought the other way for so long in, in your whole life, um, it doesn't come easy. It doesn't. It doesn't happen overnight. It, it's something that you have to continue to remind yourself. You continue to renew your mind. You continue to think about it. You continue to uh you know to 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 meditate on it and and realize that God is the designer and it doesn't really matter how you look on earth you know what your rating is on earth whether and anyone even recognizes you on earth it really doesn't matter that's not the issue it's all about what he decides and if you're if you're interested to know what where you might land, okay, and and how that's gonna come out, um, 
Jesus is about to tell them. So if you want to know what the, what is the criteria, how does this work? Uh, you know, how would we know? How can we anticipate where we're going to end up in the kingdom of God? How we're going to be rated? He, by the way, notice um, he doesn't he doesn't discourage them for their spiritual ambition, and and that's important to understand. He he doesn't discourage spiritual ambition. He he never does. He never says, "How dare you talk about greatness?" You know, humble yourself, and 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 stop. See, that, that 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 is uh, forbidden to to talk about that topic. No, he doesn't do that. Neither does Paul. By the way, Paul talks about rewards all the time, about you know accruing heavenly wealth. Um, it's it's not it's not forbidden to discuss it, but if you don't understand how it works, then you're just spinning your wheels. In fact, you make you're probably making your your situation much worse. Uh, than if you had no spiritual ambition at all. But spiritual ambition is nothing, it's always encouraged. If, if you want to rate high in the kingdom of God, if that's if that's what you want, you have spiritual ambition, uh, you know, he says, I'll tell you how to do it. I mean, if that's what you want. Um, it's not, but it's not going to be what, what you might, what you're used to. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not going to be like that. Um, but, uh, there's nothing wrong with spiritual ambition. Many times Paul would encourage it. You know, you, sh you should uh, strive to be a, an overseer, you know, uh, in, 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 a, in a passage that it's a good thing to want to be in that, in that position, in that role. Of course, it's, you know, a lot of work. It's it, like I've said in the last episode, many times a thankless job. Um, there aren't any perks, very little perks. And, and you're just you're just grinding away, right? You're just you're just doing your doing your job and trying to do it very very well, um, because if you don't do it well, uh, you could be in a worse position. So there's that. But um, so so the idea that that you have spiritual ambition is actually a good thing. At least you're passionate about that. At least you want to engage. At least say you know if I'm in this, I want to do it well. I want to understand it. I want to know how I can best please my master. How how I can get that well done, good and faithful servant type of thing. You'll be in charge of ten cities. You'll be in charge of five. You know whatever. I, I want to get that. That you know that's not a bad thing. Uh, Jesus never discourages it. He just he just tells them, but you're going about it all wrong. Okay. You're going about it all wrong. But the idea that you want that is good. That's fine. But understand how you get there. Because if you don't, you're gonna you're just gonna dig yourself a deeper hole. You're you're gonna make yourself worse uh than if you didn't have spiritual ambition. You know what I mean? So uh so he says, so the ten become indignant. Now, so uh, so James and John, they had, you know, wrong ideas about how this works, uh, you know, getting on the right and the left and the spiritual ambition, the mother, same thing. Uh, but the 10, the same thing. They also had wrong ideas because otherwise they would not become indignant. The only reason why they became indignant is because how dare you go behind our backs and try to get, the, you know, this, a, a, a position in, in the kingdom. A, a superior position than us, you know, and the mother probably what got a lot of dirty looks about, you know, you know that that's that's a, you know that's a that is not cool, right? That that's 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 a stab in the back right there, um, you know, and and this but this is this is what happens in ecclesia. So so this this kind of competition, this kind of jealousy and strife and all that kind of stuff was going on among the disciples, okay. It goes on. It goes on in, in in the ecclesia, and it's it's very damaging. It's destructive. Okay, it, it's it's and, and it's all wrong. the 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 mindset is completely um, useless. I mean, all you're doing is is making things worse for yourself by engaging in that mindset. Okay, you're you're lowering your position in doing that, uh, applying competition, worldly competition into. Uh, an ecclesia of God or any kind of spiritual context. You're actually making making your position worse. All right. Um, 
But so they become indignant with the two brothers, but Jesus called them to himself and said, he goes, he goes, look, I mean, he said this before, right? I mean, he has said this before, but he he realizes they still don't get it. They still don't understand. Um, and this is just one of the many things they couldn't wrap their head around, right? Um, so he, he brings them, he brings them to himself and says, look, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, okay? Um, so you have the rulers that rule over the Gentiles and the rulers of the Gentiles. I don't know why he he, he chose Gentiles. Uh, I think it's the same thing with the Jews, you know, at the time. But, you know, he wanted to give this example, this illustration of, of kind of like, you know, these, uh, um, these, I don't know what they called them. Uh, I forgot the names of, you know, um, uh, governors, I guess, was one of them. But they had all these, you know, these government titles. And and they would, you know, they watched how the governor or or these these people in authority would treat those underneath them. And it was always with disdain or, you know, kind of like treating them like slaves and with disrespect and and just telling them, just throwing commands at them like uh like they're like they're dogs and and they're there to serve the ruler and and that and that's this is what he, this is the illustration he's made you you know these rulers of, of the gentiles lord it they lord their authority over the those that uh that they that they command and they lord it over them they they bully they they send them and on errands or command them what to do and discipline them harshly if they don't do it uh, timely and right and show respect and all of that kind of stuff, right? So he's saying, you know that this is true and and their great men exercise authority over them, okay? So, you know, those in, in higher status, or they're, they're, they're socially, uh, you know, uh, at, at a, you know, at a higher station. And, and and these you know these great men will exercise authority to tell tell the peasants what to do and and get out of their way and and you know better watch yourself and all that kind of stuff because uh you know they have superior positions right um and he says yeah you know you're well familiar with the world and how the world treats authority and how and how it looks and 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 the privileges of authority and rulers um You've seen it, you grew up with it, you know how it looks, but let me tell you something. That's the world, that's Satan's kingdom, that's how it works there, but it's not that it's not this way among you. Okay? It's not that not this way among you because you're sons of the kingdom. All right. So, being sons of the kingdom, okay? Um whoever wishes to become great among you, shall be your servant, all right? So you wanna know who's who's gonna be great? Just look at who is serving you, okay? Whoever is serving you, that guy is gonna be greater than you. That That's pretty much his message. Now go ahead and compete, <laughs> right? I mean, knock yourself out, compete away. <laughs> if you wanna compete, there's the criteria. That's how people are going to be judged. That's how that's how decisions are going to be made. That's how that that's how uh, the that's the criteria the father looks at when he's deciding who is going to take the right or the left, take these uh, positions of authority. All right, you know it, it's it's the same thing as as wanting to be an overseer. You want to be an overseer, great, and you'll you'll have that title. But what comes on with the title is that you are servant now. You you serve uh, in in a in a higher capacity with with greater intensity with gr more passion than the rest. And and you serve with love and and you know and and willingness. That's how it. That's what it looks like. So are are those that are governed in the kingdom of God? They're going to love their rulers. Who wouldn't? Their rulers are, are there to help and to serve. Now, that's what a real public servant looks like, right? You know, the, the fake stuff in the world, no, worthless. 
but in 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 the kingdom of God, it's actually true. That's why do you think in the millennium that the, though the ungodly are going to love the way that they are being governed in in the millennium because the the the, the, the those that are in authority that are ruling over the ungodly are those that are serving the ungodly. Okay, they're doing everything they can to make the life of the ungodly better, enrich their lives, enrich their their experience, uh, make give make it easier for them. No corruption. Uh, every dollar will be spent to better the lives, and and the ungodly will never have it so good. Can you imagine if all the taxes raised actually went to help the citizens in a fair way without corruption and graft and and all of the, the the shortcuts and the nonsense and the waste that goes on today, all the pork? Can you imagine if, if you had a ruling class that you could trust completely? They would never waste a dime of your money but they would spend it all and making sure and work really hard, work overtime to make sure that every dime is spent in, in, the, in the best way possible to solve problems, to make life easier, to you know, pave the streets, to actually you know, make, put things in working order, uh, you know, uh, design cities properly, you know, all that kind of stuff that government does you know, I mean, this this is what I'm saying. It, it's that would be a miracle. Everyone would love it. Are you kidding? If you could trust your government, that would be insane. That's like utopia, right? But this is what utopia looks like. It's it's it has to come from um, a a uh, a rulers that are um, authentic followers of Christ. And, and and of course they'll be in the glorified body at, at the time of the millennium. So they'll they'll will be completely authentic uh, followers of Christ. They will be extensions of Christ, serving and 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 basically doing everything they can uh, for those that they that they rule over. And that's that's what it looks like. Okay. Now you want to compete? Go for it. Now, see that that that's the um, you know that's the rub. That that's why the kingdom of God is so awesome. Uh, the higher you go, the more you serve, and those that are underneath you love it. They're you know they couldn't be happier. I mean, uh, they're getting a lot of the service, and they want to serve others, and it just trickles down, and and it just you know, and and it, and it just uh, it it builds on one another. And and that's why it, it's just such a beautiful experience. And he says, so whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, it's the same concept. You you want to be first? Okay. Then then look at who is being your slave. Who 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 is being the person that is trying to exalt you? is trying to lift you up, is trying to edify you, is trying to make you look good, because that's what slaves do. They want to make their master look good. They want to bring glory to their master, right? So who who is it among you that is trying to make everyone else look good and and uh and and be excellent and and uh and shine and and reach their full potential. And, and all that kind of, that's the guy that's going to be great in the kingdom of God, you see. Um, so whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, you see. Um, so, so the slave is not someone that will ever usurp or undermine you, or or try to sabotage you in any way. The slave is is there to serve you and to make you look good. Okay, um, and that's really and they know how to do that. By the way, a good slave understands how to edify another. 
right? How to make them look good. And it's not just looking, when I say looking good, I don't mean looking good among men. I mean looking good to God, right? Because uh, that's what all that matters. You know, we're in the kingdom of God now. And you want uh, the, the one you serve to look good before God, okay? Just to be clear. And, and that's what the slave does. The slave is going to do everything he can to uh, equip the master, to, uh, you know, to kind of guide the master if, if need be, um, um, you know, and, and give them everything that they have everything that they need and 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 more so so that they look good before God okay that's what a sl that's what the slave a slave does in the kingdom of God so um and wouldn't that be great I mean everyone you know encouraging with truth and love because that's what edifies the best right um so so every wishes to be first among you shall be your slave just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now notice, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but yet the disciples served him all the time. They would, they would go get food for him. They would uh, prepare the way for him. They would uh, get his donkey that he needs. Uh, they would, you know, push away the crowds for him so it looks as though you know that it says the son of man did not come to be served but 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 jesus you know we we do all kinds of things for you and and, and you know and that's true they they did do all kinds of and the women did all kinds of things for jesus during his ministry right during those three years um so what what does he mean you know i i didn't come to be because that's not the purpose that that's not that wasn't the reason why he was doing his ministry is to is to benefit from the service. It's it's not like he would he wouldn't say oh, I, I would no one's ever served me. No, he wouldn't make he wouldn't make that claim because it's it's just not true. People did serve him happily, eagerly, right? Um, and but that's not why he came. He didn't he didn't come as you know you know in in this. Uh, as the son of God, as the Messiah, for people to bow down to him and, and give him whatever he needs and wants. That's not why he came, okay? It, it just happened in the last three years during the ministry that there was a, uh, an opportunity for, for, for uh, others to serve him in, in, in certain capacities, right? Usually in, in material capacities, in, in capacities of, of logistics or, or convenience or, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, people had that opportunity and it was an opportunity because, you know, <laughs> you can't get a better uh, job than to serve the son of God, right? I mean, that is like a pretty major uh, privilege, right? So, um, but he didn't come for that. Like, like others would, they, they compete to uh, be a ruler in the world so that others would serve them. You see, that, that's the reason why they're working so hard to uh, get higher up and having more authority and being the top dog is so that others would, would you know, serve as every need. That, you know, a lot of, that, that's usually the motivation of, of many ambitious people in the world, right? Uh, but he says, no, I, didn't, I didn't come for that. That, that does not thrill me. That that doesn't, um, you know. I mean, I'm I'm sure it makes him happy to know that others that are serving him in different ways, they are going to get rewarded for it. That that's the joy that he finds. Not 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 the you know getting stuff for free or the joy he finds is they're going to get rewarded for that and and bless them. You know, that's good. I like to see people to be lifted up. Um, but just as the as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. He came to give his life over. And his service, okay, um, was in, in, a, in a capacity as a Messiah, right? He came as the Messiah to serve as the Messiah. So there were things he had to do. And, and it's like when he had to heal every single, when he healed every single person that would come, 
I, that would exhaust him, right? He was just completely wiped out, I'm sure. And, 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 and just healing after healing after healing after heal, healing. So, and, and getting up early to, to pray and, and to connect and to, and to recharge, um, very disciplined. So he came to just give, pour out his life, to pour out his life as Messiah, because that was his role. That was his role. He had to serve in his role. And so he poured out everything he had in that role. And, 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 that, and, and that role to serve his people, you know, the people that he, uh, uh, you know, as high priest that he would represent, that he would advocate for, for, for whom he'd advocate. That people, that's who he was pouring his li life out for. So, um, so that's, that's what it means. He, he came to serve. He came to give his life. He came to drink that cup. He came to, um, to do everything he can in the role that was given to him. Okay. That doesn't mean that he would go around uh, every day and, and, and go and, and find food for everybody. Right. Cause that wasn't part of his role. It just, you know, he had th duties to do obligations and, and things like that, that he had to take care of in his role. And, 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 but, but, but he was serving in that role uh, for, the people of God, right? For his people. Um, he, everything he did was for them. And that's the important thing. Um, so the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and give his life, give his entire life from beginning to end. I mean, he was working on his role from the very, you know, when, when he was conscious, you know, he, he was always working on his role. He was always preparing himself, learning the scriptures, doing a lot of study, right? A lot of study. Not, you know, wouldn't go out and heal people when he was 12 uh, uh, or 14 or, or, or 10 or whatever. He didn't, he didn't go and try to, uh, you know, do all kinds of uh, community service. There, there's no real indication of that. Um, it's not like he was known for that. He was known to be a carpenter's son. Uh, was he kind to people? Was he fair with people? Sure. Uh, but did he uh, go out and 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 just you know try to feed as many homeless uh, feed as many um, homeless as he could or or you know do that? No, not necessarily. I mean, there's no, there's no indication of it. Uh, you know, that's not what he was known for. He wasn't known as 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 the great. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you, you humanitarian, you know, as an example, that that's, that's not what, it, I mean, no one ever mentioned that as some, well, isn't he the humanitarian that, that won all kinds of awards for, for his kindness to beggars and all that? No, not really. Uh, that, that's really, there's no indication of it. What, what, what he did was he, uh, he did his job as, as a carpenter it's not like he didn't do those things. It's just that uh, that he didn't uh, make a name for himself doing those things. Um, he did his job as a carpenter. He worked very hard studying and learning and 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 being able to so he can teach and and make sure that he's got the message and he understands the new covenant and he can be able to teach it and understand his 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 opponents and what they believe. Right? He had to know. He had to know the Pharisaical and, and all of the Jewish religious establishment. He had to know their ideas very well, right? In addition to knowing the truth. So he had to know their ideas, uh, where they were messing up, where they read scripture wrong, how they went astray. Um, because he would always mention about things like that, you know, that you, you, you didn't, you don't, uh, you don't incorporate justice, mercy, and, and faith in, in your in your examples and in your in your living. So he became very familiar with the religious establishment and knew it backwards and forwards. And and he also knew the the the, the true uh, you know uh, translation, the, the true interpretation of of God's word. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done, a lot of work, a lot of training, 
uh, that he needed to do to prepare himself for these three years. Uh, and just, you know, the parables that he would come up with, I mean, you, you wonder, did he think these things up before he started his ministry? He might have. These are things that may have come to his mind that the father put in his mind as illustrations. He says, "Oh, I'm going to use that one." You know, when I when I do. so I don't know, but he was doing for 30 years. He was doing a lot of preparation for his role. Okay, um, and so so when he says gives it give his life, we're not just talking about the crucifixion. We're not just talking about um, you know the the, the, the torture that he went through. And 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 all of that, we're talking about his whole life, okay? His whole life, he never had worldly ambitions. He never became the greatest carpenter of Nazareth, or or the richest, or any of those kind, of, any of that kind of stuff. He never had worldly ambitions. Everything he did was all about uh, uh, preparing for and executing his role as Messiah. And, and and he was very, very, very knowledgeable about everything that was going on, all the worldly events, everything. I mean, he had to be. That was part of his role. Okay. So when it says give his life a ransom for many, it's his whole life. It's not just his death, right? It's, it's everything that happened before that. Um, and people don't really take that into account, I think. I don't. I don't think they really understand. You know, at least you know, thirty years is a long time of preparation, and he, believe me, I'm sure he worked every minute of it, and 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 continuing to learn and to be, uh, and and to grasp all of the truth of God, uh, throughout the entire entire life. So, um. So that's what he did. That that's what he did. Uh, and and he's basically saying, uh, I I didn't have to, I, I could have just you know, um, as the son of God with with this kind of power with this kind of uh, acceptance by God, uh, I could have had you know, lo looking for people to to serve me to to lift me up to exalt me to to make me the the highest scribe in the land, uh, you know this kind of stuff, but that's that's not. That wasn't his role. That wasn't what he was there to do. He was there to serve. Uh, next time he's going to come to judge, right? Um, but his main goal at that, you know, his main objective at that time, he was there to serve. And and so, and that's what he did. His, his whole life was dedicated to fulfilling that aspect of his role as, as Messiah. So, and that's how we are to think. And that's how we are to live. That our whole life should be wrapped around uh, understanding our role and understanding what God has and, and understanding the truth and understanding the, the commands of Christ, the, the new covenant, the old covenant. Uh, this is what we should have been doing since, we were, you know, I mean, theoretically speaking, that, that's how we are to serve. We are, we are to give our lives for the people of God, okay? Um, so this is spiritual ambition. This is the correct spiritual ambition. This is, if, if you want to, to be ambitious, this is how you do it. You know, when I, Jesus never discouraged spiritual ambition. He just said, just understand how you accomplish it. Okay, you gotta know the rules. You gotta know the criteria. Look at me. You know, talk about being spiritually ambitious, right? I mean, Christ is the king of kings now, right? He, he was exalted at the top spot, and this is how he did it, okay? Now, if you want to get to a higher spot, this is how you need to do it, you see? This is the point. And, and people may not recognize it. People may not... Uh, ever see it because your goal is to look good before God and not necessarily before men. So, um, so that needs to be your focus. That that needs to be what consumes you, and that that's what that you need to be obsessed with. That understanding what that means. Now, 
and, and of course, it's very important that you do understand what that means. How do you look good before God? What does it mean? Well, we went through, that's what a lot of this series is about, is seeking first, seeking the kingdom of God as your first priority in your life, obeying the commands of Christ. That's how you look good before God. That's what you do, okay? That should be your passion, your obsession, your prayers. Your, you, know, you, you should be constantly preparing, constantly doing that. that. Dedicate your entire life. That's what you need to do to be spiritually ambitious. So um, I wanted to bring that up because in an ecclesia of God, ambition in and of itself is not wrong. It's just you need to understand how to accomplish that. Okay, and and what that looks like, okay, and this is this is what Christ is telling us, and he's got there's other passages also of similar. This is probably one of the better ones as far as explaining things and, and showing himself as an example. But this is uh, this is how you do it if 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 you want if if that's what you want, and I hope that's what everyone would want. I mean, I, you want to encourage that, right? Um, so. Uh, so, you know, it, it's the suffering, you're, you're, you're going to suffer, and we're going to look at some, some uh, verses on that. Uh, you serve um, as Jesus served, you sacrifice your life to serve, um, you're, you're there to look good, uh, you're, you're there to please God the Father. Um, in, in this case, pleasing God the Father is pleasing your master, and um and 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 you and you want to lift people up, lifting people up. You're you're wanting, you know, what Christ did for us in in redeeming us, in sanctifying us, in justifying us, is uh, what more could He do for us, right? To, to put us in that position is insane. I mean, I mean, He couldn't have given us a better gift than what He gave. I mean, it's just a phenomenal gift that he gave us uh and 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 the spiritual benefits that he's given to us right is is off the charts obviously and and that's the kind of thing that you need to do for others you got to give spiritual benefits that are off the charts in 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 your in your interactions okay where where you lift them up and and you make them look good before god because jesus certainly made us look good before god he certainly made us look good. Um, and now we are going to be the queen. Okay? That's how good he made us look. Okay? You see? So, you know, edifying us, exalting us, that's exactly what he did before God. And that's what we need to do for others before before God. You see what I'm saying? That's our should be our goal, is to exalt others before God. Um, so, um, once you understand that, once you can grasp that, uh, what it means to be spiritually ambitious, all of the jealousy and strife, gone. You don't see that anymore. It just doesn't, it disappears, you see. The antidote for, for all of, uh, uh, the, you know, all of that competition is understanding what it means to compete in the kingdom of God. That's the antidote, and and to really get your head around it, what it means, and to live according to your understanding of what it means. Okay, once you do that, all that worldly jealousy and strife disappear. That's why that's why Paul calls that fleshly. That's just worldly stuff. I mean, it, it it's 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 nonsense. It all it does is harm you. The very thing that you think. You're, you're, you're gaining recognition, that you're gaining uh, uh, a higher position. No, you're actually going down. You're actually losing uh, uh, your position. And, and, you're, and you're getting worse. You're becoming in more and more inferior in the kingdom of God. Okay? So it's kind of ironic. You know, again, that's why people call it the upside-down kingdom sometimes. Um, but it, it's 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 really uh, again you play by the rules of the kingdom of god when you're in the ecclesia of god you have to play by the rules of the kingdom of god not the world and you don't bring in those worldly rules in the, in the ecclesia of god they don't belong they have no place okay 
once you do that, once you understand that, and once you wrap your head around that, then jealousy and strife, it, there's no room for it. And, there's, and, and, and it just disappears because it, there's, what's the point? There's no point to it anymore, right? So um, there you go. Um, now, uh, I, I wanted to, you know, because we were talking about, you know, this idea of, wait, let's get back to, okay. So we're, we're talking about this idea about um, uh, the, this problem that the Corinthian Ecclesia had and, and these divisions that would, that would exist and we talked about the reasons why, mostly because of the flesh, but in part it was it's be also because uh, of the uh, of the purpose of the Holy Spirit to uh, identify those that are chosen to be overseers. Okay, and the initial overseers are chosen by the Spirit. And that doesn't mean that more can't be chosen in the future, right? I just want to be clear, but um, but the initial ones are chosen by the Spirit, and these kinds of disagreements and divisions happen in ecclesia as a way of identifying and and making those chosen to be evident to the others. But the problem is, what if what if the ecclesia members don't get it? What if the ecclesia members Somehow, because they're just so twisted, right? They, you know, they just, they don't really understand. Um, um, they, they don't understand how do I, how, how to notice or how to identify or how to, how to, uh, um, you know, how do you, you know, discover or, or recognize, I guess. They, they don't know how to recognize the 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 holy spirit's choice and and they unfortunately go the other way and, and this is this is what happened in um in third john uh and and this is always something that just kind of shocking when you know when you read it and you're going how could this happen in an ecclesia of god how can this be you know and i assume it's still an ecclesia of god i mean there's no clear uh, you know, there's, there's no clear instruction either way, but you know, this is just, you know, this is John, the apostle John, um, talking to, uh, he's called it the elder to the, to the beloved Gaius. Okay. Now I know there's a Gaius in, in, in the Corinthian ecclesia. I don't think this is the same guy. I don't think it's the same ecclesia because he talks about how, um, where does it say it? It talks about how Gaius is one of his children. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Now, usually, when you when when an apostle refers to another one as a child, as a child, as his child, it, it you know just as Paul referred to Timothy as his child, it's it's usually that, that John was the one that led them to to salvation or led them to Christ or led him or delivered the message or gave them the message and they responded to it. It, it you know, it, usually it means the apostle was the one that, that discipled, that discipled them and, and trained them and all that kind of stuff. So my thought is if the apostle John was the one that kind of discipled Gaius, it couldn't have been in Corinth because Paul was the, the initial guy there. And I think, Gaius was mentioned, uh, and the, and the gospel came through Paul, and Ga and Gaius would respond to it. So I don't know. So it, it doesn't seem like it's the same Gaius. Uh, it's not the same ecclesia. Uh, so I don't. And usually John would deal with ecclesia, ecclesia in Asia, because all all the seven in Revelation, all the seven ecclesia are in Asia, and John was given the task of you know delivering those messages to the ecclesia. Um, and, and he was off of Patmos, which is, is near Asia. So, um, so I don't know what Ecclesia this is, but, um, 
but he, he he's writing to this guy uh uh gaius and and he's talking about you know you know we're really thankful for you you're, you're doing great you know you're walking in the truth you're you're helping out the the your brothers that are that are coming and 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 want and, and are being sent out to 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 preach the gospel and and this kind of stuff and 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 you are doing great and and you're doing good and you're not following evil um so so you know th this is what so he's got nothing but praise for gaius he says you know uh you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren especially when they are strangers so you have strange uh men of uh you know men of god that that are believers that are that are being sent out to preach the gospel they they go to the house of gaius gaius you know welcomes them and and you know makes sure that they have their their you know they're fed and they're they're giving clothes and and they're being equipped for their journey forward um and and john is saying you're doing great and that, that's just just awesome and they have testified uh to your love they, so they 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 come back and they say you know gaius was just loving and and kind and and just really genuine and you they have testified to your love before the ecclesia so the, i imagine the ecclesia in the, where john is uh, you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Okay, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Maybe, you know, this is something that, um, and maybe Gaius is a Jew. Sounds like Gaius is probably a Jew. Um, so the, these people would follow the 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 uh, the example of Paul, and and would not accept. Uh, things from the gentiles where they where they were they were sent and 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 to preach the gospel of the kingdom of god uh and and they would uh, you know again just following the example of paul it sounds like um therefore we ought to support such men uh so that we may be fellow workers with the truth okay so they're doing it right they're imitating paul as paul you know commanded them to do um and uh, they're 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 proceeding in the same manner, uh, foregoing their right to uh, you know to 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 have their necessities uh, taken care of or or provided for by the uh, by by those that are, that they're serving that they're preaching to, they're foregoing that right. They're not they're not insisting on it. They they just don't accept anything. Just like Paul had in the same in the same vein. And and so you want to be supporting. You want to support these people. You want to support these men. They they are fellow workers with the truth. Okay, is what John is saying. And then apparently uh, Gaius uh, is um, near an ecclesia that because says I wrote something to the ecclesia. Okay, and I imagine this is the ecclesia that's nearby Gaius. Um, but Diotrephus who loves to be first among them. So there's, here's a guy with worldly ambition in an ecclesia of God. You know, and you wonder, if you have worldly ambition, what are you doing in an ecclesia of God? I mean, it, it's just so incompatible. I mean, why would you, wouldn't you take your worldly ambition and go somewhere else and compete in the world and get some real power and get some real riches? You're not going to get rich in an ecclesia of God, especially in an ecclesia of God, Okay. They they weren't you know bursting with money right that's not the way it was that not the way it worked so why are you wasting your time in an ecclesia of God uh, trying to fulfill worldly ambition it's just it's it's just again we talked about this before why would someone waste their time doing that what why do people waste their time doing that because I've seen it happen um it you know part of it I guess is just because they're there. They they believe that they're authentic. They believe they're a disciple of Christ. They believe that that they're you know a Christian, so to speak, and and they just revert to their old ways about that when they're there, they want to be recognized, right? They they want they want to feel important, okay? Um, so they don't understand that they're completely destroying their position 
in in the in the in the glorified kingdom of God, um, if they even get there, they may never get there by by doing what they're doing, especially this guy, this Diotrephes guy. Um, but he loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. So he's basically saying that the apostles don't know what they're talking about. Apostle John doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, I'm not going to accept. You know, they, he sent a letter. I don't want to. I don't want to hear it. That that's what's going on. Um, for this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does. Okay, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. So this guy is not only try, banning all of this communication from John. And I don't know if that communication is being read. I don't know what's happening. But this guy has got a lot of power and a lot of control in this ecclesia. Okay. And and John is saying, if I come over there, I am going to, I, I, I'm going to call him out and say, you know, look, this guy is is, is telling a bunch of lies uh, about us and 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 just defaming our names and trying to undermine our authority, trying to uh, you know. Uh, uh, trying to sabotage our work and our influence and our position as as a, as an apostle, as John is an apostle, and here's this guy in an ecclesia of God uh, trying to destroy the leaders. Uh, you see, in my view, if you're going this far, if you're going, if you're this twisted, okay, this has got to be a satanic thing. I mean, why in the world would anyone bother? To, to do all have so much energy to try to you know claw your way to the top of an ecclesia that that has no influence in the world little to no influence in the world and it, it has no money okay why in the world would you do that it has to be some sort of demonic you know twisted uh, appetite that is just Satan trying to destroy an ecclesia of God. I mean, that's just really sons of the evil one. Those tares that are sown in a wheat field, those are just sons of the evil ones. These, these are just people that are motivated by Satan. And that's that happens. And it's hard to get your head around that. Because you, you, you're thinking logically. You're thinking logically, why would anyone come to a gathering you know, someone of, of worldly ambition come to a gathering of of Christians that, that don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of power and influence, and, and just start trouble just just for fun. Why would they do that? You see, it's hard for you to uh, to uh, to think that these people are plants. You know, these people are actual, uh, you know, motivated by Satan, a son of the devil. Okay, that's what he calls them in the in the parable of, of the tares, right? And that we because we don't think in those terms, unfortunately, we don't. You know, I know there are some that 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 see uh, you know angels and devils everywhere, and I get that. But but the fact that there aren't these things happening when you see it in scripture, it's described to you in scripture. Okay, this isn't something you're making up. This is something you see told to you by Christ in scripture and 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 to not think that that's real is naive and it's it's almost like saying Jesus yeah you went too far you're exaggerating but he's not exaggerating this does happen there are tares among the wheat that satan sows in the wheat field that are are left to grow with the wheat among the wheat and you have to understand that if you are going to be part of an ecclesia of God, you have to understand and look out for that. That there will be people that are twisted. And you say, well, they must have good motives. They must, they must be, they, they seem sincere and authentic. They, they're just maybe misguided. But we need to understand them. Not necessarily. These people could be motivated by Satan. You have to leave that open as an example, as a possibility. Okay, you, you just you just do because Jesus warned you about it himself. So you would be foolish not to take heed of that warning. Okay, that that's just important. That's important to understand. 
in, in an ecclesia of God. All right. That these tears are real and and it doesn't make any sense, any logical sense, even under in, in the worldly standards, because it does because it is irrational. It does it doesn't even really, it's not even consistent in the worldly standards. But it's not the worldly standards that's happening here. It's it's you know the supernatural that's going on. And there's a satanic influence on this person, whether the person understands that or not. He may not understand that. He may not see that, but it's still there. And you, you, you know, so you have to have your eyes open up for that because this guy here, this diatrophies, he was definitely some, a, a son of the evil one. And he was planted in that ecclesia. And, 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 and what did the other members do? They gave him all kinds of power. They gave him, you know, they, they submitted to this guy's influence. Why? What was he doing? Was was it through intimidation? Yeah, some of it was intimidation, because look what look what happens. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call attention to his deeds, and he unjustly accuses us. So he's sla he's slandering, he's slandering the apostle. That should be a big red flag right there. Unjustly accusing us with wicked words. Not satisfied with this. So not only is he undermining uh, the authority of the apostle questioning the apostle uh, and and accusing them of, of of lies that that are all kinds of wicked uh, wicked deeds uh no no doubt um <clears throat> but but he's still not satisfied he he's going to go another level he's going to take it he's going to take it up another notch and what is he going to do he himself does not receive the brethren all right so the, the brethren that come through through his town he won't receive them all right he says you know move on if you're if you're from if you're from the apostle john and his ecclesia uh you're not welcome you, you know you're shunned you know you're wicked you're full of evil that's what he'll do right they, they always turn the tables you're the wicked one you're the evil one it's the wicked calling the righteous wicked right that's what they do. So um, that's what this diatrophist would do. Wouldn't receive them. And, and in addition to that, he forbid those who desire to do so. So if, if someone says, well, you know, shouldn't we, you know, shouldn't we take them in? I mean, they, they, they're, they're from the Apostle John. He's got this letter of recommendation, endorsement. I mean, he's, he's a believer. He's a brother. I mean, shouldn't we? I mean, isn't this what Christ told us to do? Is to make sure that we take care of these people, and and He would say, "Nope, don't you dare, don't you dare take them in, because if you do take them in, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you out of the ecclesia." This is the kind of power He had. Um, and and it's just like, what? Are you kidding me? This guy could have that that kind of power to put him out of the ecclesia. To excommunicate someone for trying to, uh, you know, try, trying to offer hospitality to another brother. You see, this is the kind of irrational, wicked, just. Uh, but look, I, I it doesn't surprise me that there are people that would do that. That doesn't surprise me. What surprises me is that the ecclesia allowed him to do it. That's what's shocking. That's what's scary. What what are you doing? Are you are you seriously that gaslit? Are, are you seriously allowing this guy to have so much power and control that you're basically that he's basically causing you to do evil and and you're so afraid of him, which means you're not afraid of Christ, the head. You're afraid of this guy that you, you're going to hesitate to take in these brethren and offer them hospitality because you're afraid that he has power over you. See, this is a very twisted ecclesia. This is, and, and for all I know, maybe it's no longer an ecclesia of God, you know, and, and everyone needs to run, okay? Um, but this, this, is the, this kind of stuff can happen where 
sheep, the authentic sheep, you know, um, who don't, they don't have worldly ambition. I mean, if, if you, you know, they're not trying to gnaw their way to the top like this guy, <coughs> Diotrephes. Um, so, and, and so they're, they're more just kind of watching, observing and trying to understand and they're giving and they're not allowing for the fact that Satan is at work. They're not allowing for the fact that Satan is attacking them, that, that Satan hates them and, and wants to destroy them. You're not, you're not tuned into that. They're, they're thinking they're, they're being more, uh, Pollyanna. They're, 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 they're trying to be more, uh, you know, wishing the best for every, that everyone has pure motives. And it's just, it's not, you're not taking into account the fact that Satan has tares that are sewn in. And that, and they, not everyone might have pure, would have pure motives. And so you have to discern and you can't give power to, to these kind of people. Okay. This is, uh, this is a is it's very important as members of an ecclesia that you can understand it and discern it and 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 be able to guard against it like Paul was telling them in Acts 20 you have to guard against it okay if you're not guarding against it they will overwhelm you as as we saw in the message of the ecclesia in revelation and so it's not fun sometimes you don't want to think evil of people. You don't want to think that maybe they're not being motivated by the Spirit. Maybe they're being motivated by Satan. And you sound like, ooh, yeah, that's, that sounds a little extreme. That seems a little harsh. But Jesus was well aware that Satan was, was very much involved. Okay? He talked about the evil one all the time. He, I mean, that... He, Jesus always factored in the evil one when when trying to assess a situation. Always. That that was always on his mind. He knew who his enemy was. He knew who his opponent was. And he understood the fruits of Satan. And that's why he said, get thee behind me, Satan, to Peter. Because that deception was one of the fruits of Satan. Right? That, that was a satanic deception about the Messiah never dying. So he understood it, he, he identified it, and he wanted Peter to identify it. He wanted Peter to see it. That's why he said what he said. Peter, that's of Satan, okay? Get rid of that mentality, get rid of that idea. But Peter didn't know how to, how to wrap his head around that. I mean, he couldn't, he, could, he, he, he just wasn't ready to see it. But, but that's, you know, this is just something that uh, everyone that that's serious about being involved in ecclesia, uh, you have to understand, and and try to go in prepared, try to go in with your eyes open, knowing that you're a big target. There's a big target on your back, and there's people there that might be sewn in to your ecclesia that are not taking orders from Christ, and they're not taking orders from the Spirit, and they look good, they they might look very good. They might look like they're very authentic and, and sincere, but you have to look at their fruits of obedience. You have to, you have to discern. It's just, it's just your job. And, and you got to be careful, right? I mean, and you can't rip out the tares. You just got to overrule them, <laughs> right? You, you just can't give them the control and the power over the ecclesia. That's, you know, a tear should not dominate a wheat field. Okay, the wheat field should be dominated by wheat. All right, not the tares. But unfortunately, sometimes, uh, and that's part of your service for the people of God, is just sometimes you need to stand up. And sometimes you need to confront. That's part of your service. Serving doesn't always mean laying down and being passive and just taking care of everyone's needs, material needs. It, 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 you know. Now, man may look at service that way. Man may recognize a slave as someone that just runs around and just you know, uh, picks up after everyone and serves everyone their food and, and does all that. Man may see that, see it that way, but Christ doesn't see it that way, and God doesn't see it that way. 
you're serving God. Understand that. Okay. As a slave, all right, you're serving God, but you in serving God, you're you're doing what God wants, and that is to edify others, to make them look good before God. Okay. To make them look good before God. And that's important to understand. Uh making sure, you know, feeding them and and washing their clothes and and uh and 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 you know giving them this, giving them that, that doesn't necessarily make them look good before God, right? It's okay to do that. There's nothing wrong with that to show love that way. And to to, to, to establish a groundwork, you know, I care about you, I love you, I'm thinking about you. I, you're on my mind. I want I want you to be that's fine, but that those kinds of acts, uh, though they show love, and they and they establish a groundwork, but they're not they don't necessarily result in making them look good before God. Okay, and a good slave, that's their, you know, that that's their goal. So allowing some guy, uh, allow, allowing some guy to just. Um, dominate an ecclesia that has no business, uh, you know, being in charge, and and no business uh, being lording themselves over the other brethren and 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 sister, uh, um, the other members of the ecclesia. You got to stand up. That's that's your time. That that's what it means to prepare. That's what it means to be a ser- servant and be a slave is that you're going, you've got to confront, okay? So th- that's part of your job. That's part of how it works. So I just wanted to be sure that um, that we understand when we read servant, we read slave, we read those words, we're always thinking, you know, uh, the, in, in the worldly sense uh, of a slave and a servant where where you, you bend the knee and you, and you, and you, you know, you bend your, your, you bow your head and, and you give them, you know, you do whatever they tell you and all. That's, that's not, obviously that's not what Jesus meant because Jesus came to serve, but, but notice he wasn't always bowing his head and, and, and washing their feet on every occasion. He, he, he washed their feet on one occasion, but, you know, that, that was symbolic and maybe we'll get into that sometime, but, um, he wasn't always, you know, giving them food and doing it. That's not how he served. Notice that. We kind of read past that. We don't, we don't, you know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't really analyze it. But that's not how he served. That wasn't his role necessarily. I mean, it's not like he wouldn't do it. It's just that that's not a routine that he had to show that he was a servant. No. So you got to take that into account. You serve as Jesus serves. Well, he served in his role. He gave everything he had to be the Messiah that he needed to be and to and make sure that in the end, he was going to make his people look good before God. And he sure did. He sure did. It, you couldn't have done more, uh, you know, in, 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 in providing that sacrifice and how God would, would, justify us and sanctify us and perfect us as a people of God. Okay. As a, as, as a grand ecclesia, as a queen. And now it's just, it's just being fulfilled, but everyone that he represented was, was definitely assured a place in the kingdom of God. Okay. That's what he did. You, you can't do more than that. You just can't do more than that. And that's what he did as far as looking good before God and being just. So, so this, this is what I'm saying, but how did he do that? He didn't do it by going to every person, bowing his knee and, and, you know, and giving them whatever they're, they're, you know, obeying whatever command that, that was, that, that was given to him. That's not the kind of slave and service that we're talking about. So you have to get the perception. You, you got to get your perspective, right? You, you got to understand. Okay. Um, you're trying to actually do eternal good for another, not just this temporary stuff. Uh, not that sometimes the temporary stuff again lays the groundwork, shows your love, shows your interest. It, it you know gets their attention for sure a lot of times, 
and but your your ultimate goal is eternal good you know eternal uh, eternal benefits right that's that's what you really want to provide as a slave and a servant so um and you can do that many different ways it doesn't mean you're you're, you're teaching it, like 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 peter said you can win your husband over just by being submissive and doing those kind of things and being obedient and and play, and being your in your role and 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 just and just being quiet and not saying a word you can win your your husband over what are you doing when you do that you're giving your husband a spiritual benefit you're serving your husband with with an eternal benefit that's what you're doing as a wife being submissive when your husband's being disobedient to the word remember that in first in first i think it's first peter three i think it's first peter three anyway um that's what you're doing okay and and that and what are you doing you're giving your husband a spiritual benefit an eternal benefit and that is rewarded that's the kind of stuff that gets you first do you see what i'm saying it's that kind of service, that kind of 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 being a slave, where 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 you're you're putting the the person uh, in in your role, you're you're benefiting uh, those uh, that might have a uh, um, might have a, a, a higher position uh, um, than you on earth. You're benefiting them spiritually. Okay, so anyway, I I, I hope that somehow that was made clear but um and and then john goes on beloved do not imitate what is evil but what is good so you know this is evil what diatrophus is doing is evil because he's serving the evil one he, he is a servant of the evil one and he's doing evil and the one who does good is of god the one who does evil has not seen god so th this is his way of saying this guy isn't one of one of our he, he isn't one of us he isn't one of us he hasn't seen god he doesn't understand god god doesn't know him okay he's evil uh and and then he goes on about demetrius that he's sending over and and uh and and that kind of stuff so um so understand that 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 in, in an ecclesia of god uh it, it's all about spiritual benefit you know and and there's many ways to do that it's not just about you know pounding people um you know or preaching at them all the time that's that's you know obviously that's not always that's not the case that's not the way it, it's a lot about you know you do show your love with with just material service uh giving and 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 allowing people to making sure that they have a seat making sure that they're they're taken care of in that in that regard and you honor them right and and that way you have a, a way, you know, a voice, a platform, a, you know, a way to talk to them, and maybe you know influence them spiritually and giving them a spiritual benefit, which is the ultimate goal. Okay, so um, in any event, uh, so th this this is the thing that that's you know scary about this 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 whole. Um, you know this whole thing here this this account is that the ecclesia allowed him to do it i mean it's it's un, I, i'm not surprised that there aren't people like the diatrophies of course there are but the fact that the ecclesia submitted to it that's what's scary and that's and and that's the kind of thing that was going on in the in the, in the messages to the to those those five ecclesia that were in trouble they they were allowing uh, certain, or at least, especially some of them, that were really like like the Thyatira and Pergamum, um, but and and uh, you know, uh, you know the the others were. It's a little bit more fuzzy, you know. Uh, Laodicea, it's kind of like everyone's kind of lukewarm, but they're allowing leaders. The leaders are allowing others, uh, or, or or maybe the leader himself. Uh, to have too much influence on the other members of the ecclesia, on the on the ecclesia as a whole, and and the ecclesia is going down the down the drain as a result, because you're not standing up, you're not confronting, you're not battling. You know, you're not you're not engaged in that battle, and sometimes you need to be. 
you know, and it's always about discernment. You know, you don't want to take on a battle you shouldn't take on, but you don't want to dismiss a battle that you should take on. So it's, these are all judgment calls. This is what you're called to do is be a king priest. So you better, you've got to be good at it. You've got to really be in the word and, and you have to understand it and, and you have to uh, allow the spirit to teach you as you read the scripture. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I wanted to also just go through and I'm, and I'm not going to take a long time doing this because because I think we've done a lot of this before. But just as a reminder um, about the warnings that Christ gives consistently, uh, often, repeatedly, okay, that there's going to be a lot of people that look like, they look like godly men. And they look... Uh, very much like uh, a follower of Christ. That's how they present themselves, okay? And they may believe it. They may actually believe it themselves, right? Um, but it's, you know, they're not necessarily there. And, and, and you have to keep that in your mind as, as you go about the business of ecclesia, all right? Um, now, obviously, the more fruits that they exhibit, the more confidence you can have that they that they are a true a true child of God, but you just got to be careful, and, and you got to continue to 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 what? How did Paul put it in Acts twenty? You got you got to uh, stay on your guard or or keep guard or something like that. Um, but you always got to be on your guard. You always have to do it. And he says among yourselves and the flock. Right. He he included the the elders themselves make sure that you're you're watching over each other you know guarding yourselves and the flock making sure you're guarding them too so you you always have to be watching you always have to be alert you always have to be looking to see because the devil never never sleeps right he never sleeps he's always on the attack especially if you're involved in an ecclesia of god he will always be on the attack. It's relentless. It'll be relentless if, 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 if that ever becomes part of your life. You'll understand what it means to, be, to go into spiritual warfare. Definitely. Okay. It, it, it will become very real, much more real than it is now in your life. Um, so we, we talked about the narrow gate. Enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. And in your ecclesia, there will be those on the wide road. Right? They, they're, they're going to be those that are going to try to twist, pervert, like, like in, in Acts 20, uh, what, what, what Paul would say, you got to watch for these people. Uh, some will come as wolves in sheep's clothing. They will not spare the flock. Others will, uh, uh, how did he put it? Uh, others um, are, are going to, mm, I forgot how he put it. Uh, something to do with, um, I, I knew it. I, it was just there. Oh, they're, 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 they're going to, um, try to just they're trying they're, they're trying to pervert they're going to say perverse things you know try to try to twist the gospel of the kingdom of god just a little bit and maybe to, to, to better uh probably to better to be more convenient to to uh be more attractive uh to be uh less harsh all that kind of stuff or say, oh, you don't really have to design it like that. You really don't have to meet with these kind of people. Uh, if you don't get along with them, you're probably better off to break away, to divide Christ. All of these kinds of perverted type of, of teachings are going to come in to take disciples away from the ecclesia. So the disciples will follow them. Just like I am of Apollos, I am of, of Paul, I am of Cephas. That, that kind of a, a, of a deal. Where they, where they try to they pervert the gospel of the kingdom of God, and and they and they act like it's okay to 
separate and 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 get with people that you're more comfortable with, right? Or people that you enjoy or or people that interest you uh, or or people that challenge you or make you think or or you know give you things that that where you can grow better if you if you're if you're with these people because they they seem to see the faith like you see it. So that those kinds of perversions uh you know people will will you know Paul says you got to be on your guard for that. Don't don't allow that. Um and so anyway um these are the people on the wide road. The gate is small, the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. And and I was, I was trying to figure out there are few who find what? I thought at, at you know I thought at first it was the gate or maybe it's the way uh, or maybe it's life. But it turns out all these nouns are are in the feminine. And and it is is a pronoun in the feminine. So you know there's no real indication so usually you you go with the preceding life there and there are few who find life that might be it but you know it, it could be the entire way of salvation right and and it has to do with the gate and the way and and that leads to life so it's the entire way of salvation that could be it you know um, and there's few that find it that that actually go the entire way, that persevere to the end, and and uh, and and actually achieve life at, at the end. So, in any event, this is what you're dealing with, and the people that are on the broad road do believe that they're going to the kingdom, right? Um, there are many who enter through it. Where, where do they think they're entering? They think they're entering the kingdom of God, right? That's what they think. So these many believe they're going to the kingdom of God and they want to enter it th into the kingdom of God through the wide gate, okay? And, and, and that's what they're doing. So they, they're completely believing that they're on the right path. And, and yet, their path leads to destruction. But they don't believe that. They believe their path leads to the kingdom of God. And they're very sincere in their belief. And they're in your ecclesia. And they're trying to guide the ecclesia down this wide road path to destruction. And you have to, uh, you have to be on alert and be on guard and say, no, I don't think that's the right way. Let me show you scripture. Let me show you why that doesn't work. And, and you have to be able to arrest that type of momentum and make sure that the ecclesia starts going down the narrow road, you see. And that's not easy. Because these people that are, that, that, that are on the wide path, they totally believe they're going to the kingdom of God. They're very sincere. They're very authentic in that respect, they're, but they're very deceived. So this is where you are. You see how it's not easy. This is not an easy thing to accomplish. And, and it can only be accomplished through the work of the Spirit. And, 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 and that's why when you have a gathering that doesn't have the Spirit indwelling, forget it. It, it, it will shipwreck so quick it just it just won't have it it just can't make it it will never make it to the end there's so many it's fraught with peril and and problems and deceptions and and there's nothing there to arrest those all the different ways that gathering can go and and, and it'll, it'll just you know it, it it won't make it i mean if if there is, if there are gatherings of, of of new covenant believers that do have the Holy Spirit, that don't make it. Can you imagine a gathering that doesn't have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit? What are the chances that gathering 
is actually going to continue down the narrow road in their studies, in their conversation, in their discussions. None. I mean, it, 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 there's not a chance. It won't, it won't go anywhere. So, um, are these things, can these things be, you know, I don't know, can they be helpful in some way or another? Maybe, maybe for a time, maybe, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have a good future. Uh, in my, in my view, I, I just, I mean, I, I've been in, in, in a lot of these type of gatherings and it's, it gets very twisted very quick. But, um, in any event, um, so it says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves, okay? Paul talked about that. And, and these people come in sheep's clothing. So they, they've come bold, they're very confident, they're, they, they, they're, they're spouting scripture, they're you know, being very assertive, and, and they're being very authentic, and, and, they're, and they're just being sincere, and, and they're exciting, and they're charismatic, and they're coming and they're going to your ecclesia and they're saying, this is what the Lord says. And, you know, let's, let's do what the Lord commands and they're false prophets. And you have to discern and you have to figure it out and you have to make the right decision, right? You, you, have, to, you have to call it. You have to make that call. And, and he may have friends in the ecclesia that believe in him and are all on board, think he's great, and, and, the, and God's speaking through him and all of that stuff. And you have to make the call as an ecclesia. Who is this guy? And, that, and, 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 the, and the ecclesia in Ephesus did very well at that, right? Remember the message. You did that very well. You exposed them. They're false. They're not speaking the words of God. They're not speaking the words of Christ. They're not. And, and instead, they sound, the words sound good. And maybe those words could come from Christ. I don't know. Maybe they could. And, but you, you analyze it. You think about it. You judge it. You, you test it. And you have to know your scriptures to do that. And then you got to call them out. Nope. That's not right. That, that spirit that got you on that one, uh, no. That is not from Christ. It can't be. This is why. So this, you know, this is uh, this is not easy, and 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 no one's. We've never been through this kind of stuff. We've never had to to deal with this kind of kind of discernment and and calling people out and and making those judgment calls. We've never had to do that. It's your first time. You're going in it. You're and you're going. Oh my gosh! But and here's the deal: if you're if you actually become a genuine ecclesia of God, this stuff will be coming at you right and left. Because Satan is going to be after you. They're, they're really going to be after you. And, and, you, and, and you, can, you, you can see how you can become paranoid. You know, every, okay, where, where's the demon? You know, I mean, you're, you're, you can see how you could just lose it. <laughs> it, it. You know, if the devil's just, you know, pounding you with all this kind of stuff with tares, with false prophets, um, you know, wide rotors, um, jealousy and strife, all this stuff coming at you at once. Immoral behavior. How do you deal with all that? You understand, this, the reason why it's so hard is because you're a target. That's why. And, and Satan is going to be going after you like, like there's no tomorrow. And, and you're going to need all the help you can, from uh, all the help you can get from the Spirit, from Christ, um, maybe angels, you know, watching over, over the ecclesia. It, it, it's like a big battleground. It's just a big battleground now, and you're in the middle of the battle. And, and you're trying to make sure that you're not, you're not killing anyone with friendly fire. You, you know what I mean? You're, 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 tr you're, you're trying to make sure you're not killing your own. And, and you're not pulling up people that you thought were tares, but they're actually late bloomers. You, you don't know. So this is, this is the scary part. I mean, here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. I mean, look at all these examples he's giving. Boom, 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 right away. Look at this. The narrow road, wide, wide gate, the, you know, the false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits. You know, talking about how you're going to have to be a fruit inspector. You're going to have to figure out 
who is actually producing good fruit and who's producing the bad stuff, the thorns. And, and you, you, you got to understand that. See, there's a lot of preparation that, that should be going on if you're serious about this. Um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Again, you have to know the will of his Father. And Jesus tells you the will of his Father. He tells you through his commands. And, and what, you have to know it like the back of your hand. You have to understand it. And you have to know it so that you can call it out. You can discern it. Okay? It's only those that do it, not, not those that give lip service to, to, to Christ, but it's those that give life service, right? Th those that actually do the actions and produce the fruit. Uh, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? Can you imagine someone in your ecclesia doing miracles in the name of Christ? And, 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 and that person never knew Christ? Would you be able to discern that? Would you be able to see that? Would you be able to, uh, you know, not be so impressed with this supernatural manifestation that you can just say that that was awesome? And 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 it could. I mean, I'm not saying these things didn't come from God and and didn't benefit the ecclesia, right? As they're in the ecclesia, casting out demons, right? Um, prophesy in the name of Christ? Did they act? I mean, Balaam prophesied, and I don't think God knew him. I mean, I don't think he went to the kingdom, right? He's always used as a bad example. So he was, he was out, even though God used him to, to uh, give out his words. But God can use a donkey to give out his words, right? As Balaam found out. So it doesn't necessarily mean just because they may prophesy and actually give out the words of Christ or they cast out demons, okay, because Christ is, is, is or the Spirit is, is actually effectuating that work in, in, the, in, the, in the name of Christ or even, you know, performing miracles, okay? Maybe all of these things did happen by the power of the Spirit. Does it mean that that they are genuine believers? That they are that that these that these people understand the way of salvation necessarily? And he says, uh, he says many people will do this. Many. And, and then and then Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. You see, it's the practicing lawlessness. You see, it's it's those who do the will of the Father, okay, who 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 is in heaven, that they will enter. If you do the will of the Father, you, you'll enter. That that's that's the fruit of obedience. You do the will of the Father, you'll enter. If you don't do the will of the Father, you practice lawlessness. Okay. And even, even when you're doing all of these things that look very supernatural, that, that, that God may, might actually be working through this person just like he worked through Balaam. It gets complicated. You know, it's, it, it's, it's not an easy call many times. You have to be aware. You can't be easily impressed. And, and you can't be easily depressed either if someone isn't bearing fruit and you think, oh, let's, you know, I'm not listening to him anymore. They may be a late bloomer, uh, and that's like in the parable of the two sons. I don't want to. I don't want to work. But then the guy that says I don't want to work turns out to go to work. So, you know, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So he's going to go into another illustration. Look at look at all these illustrations, four in a row, the narrow and wide gate. The false prophet, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? This is how you tell the fruit, uh, the fruit of obedience. And, and 
how do you recognize obedience? Can you recognize obedience? Do you know what obedience looks like? Do you know the scriptures about what is the will of the Father? What is what is the law of Christ? Do you understand them? Can you call them out as a, as a king priest? Um, and, then, and then he's talked about the, the, the person, not everyone who knows me, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Even these people that might prophesy in his name, cast out demons in his name, and, and, and perform miracles in his name. Okay. He never says that these things aren't real. All these things could happen, but does it mean that you're that you're doing the will of the Father in your life just because God might use you to do these these supernatural acts? Right? We again, you know, just look at Balaam, and I'm sure there's more examples. But um, and then he says, I will declare, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You say, you're not doing the will of the Father, so you're practicing law lawlessness. I never knew you. So uh, there's that one. And, and now there's the one uh, which is similar, who hears this word, these words of mine and acts on them compared to a wise man, builds his house on a rock, and the rain fell and the, and the winds came and the winds blew, slammed against the house. It did, and it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Right? So it it's... You're building your house. You're making life choices based on the commands of Christ. That's how you're living your life. You're building your house where you live. You're making your life choices based on the commands of Christ, the rock. The rock is teachings and the life and the person of Christ. That, that's how you're, you're building. That's how you're making your life choices. It's on that foundation. Okay. That's the guy on the rock. He's actually doing the will of the Father. Okay, but who those who hear the words of mine and and they don't act on them, they hear it. They may even understand it. They may even understand it. They, they usually try to twist it and they try to dilute the the words. Um, but they hear the words of mine, but they don't act on them. They find them very interesting. It's very uh, thought provoking. It's very um, you know kind of. Uh, something to uh, ponder, right? You know, it's fun to think about and talk about and discuss, but no action, okay? You're not making your life choices based on these words. You're just continuing your life like, like you always did, okay? So who, whoever hears these words and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the, on the sand. Okay, and all that stuff happens and the house falls and great was its fall. All right, so another example of someone that thinks they're doing the right thing, they think they're in, they think that by hearing the words and not rejecting them, because you can hear them and not reject them. And you think, Oh, look, I heard them. I, I, I nodded in agreement. Yes, that sounds good. It all sounds good. And yet you don't act on them, but you're not rejecting them. You're not trying to oppose them, right? But you're not acting on them. You're not, you're not actually making life choices based on them, right? So what happens to that guy? You think that you're in good stead, because you didn't object to the words, that you received them and you were willing to, and you didn't oppose them and you nodded your head. Yes, it sounds right. That's true. But you don't do anything about it. You live your life as, as you normally do. You don't make any changes. There's no difference before you heard it and after you heard it. Okay? And what happens to that guy? He's building his house on sand. You know, he's building his house on this illusion that by hearing them and not objecting is enough. That's all false. Not, it's not enough. And you're, and when the winds come and when the time comes and the storm comes, you're going to fall. And that's, again, those people will be in your ecclesia. Okay. Again, th this is, you know, um, 
you know, Matthew 7, you can see how it's just, uh, there's four illustrations right there of people that think they're going to make it, that think they think they're on the right path, and they're not. Maybe the only one that might not think they're going to, you know, that they're on the right path or they, they just don't believe it at all might be the false prophet. I don't know. Um, but the rest of them really are very, you know, they they really do believe that they're on their way to the kingdom of God. And it turns out, no. And 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 these are these are four examples just in one chapter in, in, in this Sermon on the Mount in chapter seven. Okay. There's a lot more. You know, and, and maybe we'll we'll we're gonna we're gonna maybe go through those next time and, and, and just talk more about it. Because this is something you, you you have to understand. It's very important that you when you're going into an ecclesia of God, and again, that's that's what we're doing here in this video series is trying to prepare ourselves to understand it. But it's not just it's not enough just to understand it, is it? It's not enough to understand uh, the the lost ecclesia of God. You have to actually act on it. If you don't act on it, all of the work of understanding is is for naught. There has to be life choices that that has that have to be made based on this understanding. Okay, and a lot of people are saying, "But I don't know what those are," and I, and I get that. I mean, we still have to con continue down the road and 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 continue the journey, and 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 maybe you know things will start to uh, be presented to you where you still have to start making life choices and you have to start understanding, you know, all right, if I if I believe in this message, I I got to go this direction. Okay? I could ignore the message and and do what I I normally do. But if I believe it, maybe I need to go in this direction. And that's when you act on it. And so this is we're just we're we're still going down but just understand, it's never finished until you actually act on this message. You have to act on it. Otherwise, it's all for naught. If you're not acting on it, it's all for naught. Okay? Just understanding it, hearing it, and nodding in agreement is not enough. That that's what, you know, that's what's being said here by Christ, right here. He says it many times. You gotta act on it. You got to do it. Hearing is not enough. Nodding your head is not enough, or or or, ref, or refusing to oppose it, or not opposing it, or not condemning it. That's not enough. You have to actually act on it. So anyway, um, so you know, uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue on. Uh, just maybe looking at more examples, uh, and 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 looking at. At, at, at things that you need to be aware of, the things you need to be, uh, you know, concerned about. If you're if you're if you're going, if you're focusing on 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 possibly being a part of an ecclesia of God, which is something that you should all be yearning for and all be wanting. If that's where you are, okay, which where you should be, at, at, you know, at, what are we at? Sixty-seven. I mean, if you've gone this far, that's probably where your heart is. Understand, you know, we're not nearly done. There, there's a lot more that that needs to take place to go, start our way down. You know, start our way on the way of salvation. Start our journey on the way of salvation. We're just on this journey to understand it, to hear it, and understand it. But the actual acting on it, to actually one foot in front of another on the way of salvation, that's a whole different ballgame, right? That's that's where the rubber meets the road. That's what really counts. That's what really matters. It's important to understand it, and then you got to walk it. Okay, otherwise it's all for naught. All right. So uh, we'll we'll go in the next episode and we'll continue on and we'll look at some more examples um, and just kind of go through those. And I, I hope I hope you're I hope this is beneficial to you and helpful in in. You know, and just kind of rounding out the, uh, you know, and, and getting a, a better and fuller understanding of what we're doing and, and where we're going. So, um, you know, 
<sighs> we just keep going and and hopefully <laughs> something's gonna something's gonna happen right and 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 we're gonna be put to the test and and that's that's the thing you got to prepare for you got to be ready for that test so work hard is is what i'm saying so until next time thank you for watching